Good morning, church. This is Brother Jim. We're going to be talking about breaking addiction this morning. Stay tuned. All right, guys. Hey, I appreciate you tuning in with us this morning. And I'm going to start out, I'm going to ask you to uh, like and subscribe. Share this video if you would. And it uh, helps us to get the, the message out. And we just appreciate you tuning in and being with us. So, as I said in the beginning, we're going to be talking about breaking addiction today. And, you know, it, there's all kinds of ideas about it. There's all kinds of philosophies about it. And uh, I'm going to tell you something that uh, absolutely I know without a shadow of a doubt worked for me. And so we're going to go back to, uh, you know, it, it's not as important that you understand all of the, the details of why you were addicted and those types of things, because in reality, uh, your main addiction uh, I want to say too, it's not as important whether you're addicted to uh, drugs, soft drugs, hard drugs, uh, alcohol, uh, gambling, sex, whatever it is. The bottom line of addiction is that you are addicted to you and your ideas and your plan, and it's an attempt to try to make you feel better. I know this for a fact. I lived it for about 16 years and you know there's all the psychology of addiction and the uh, the chemistry of addiction and all that okay uh, you know I here's the thing that I'm gonna tell you uh, you can get lost in the weeds real quick on all of that and you can give yourself a lot of reasons why you're addicted you can give yourself a lot of excuses why you're struggling so much with getting clean. Here's the bottom line. I'm going to say it again, uh, is that the reason you're addicted and the, the reason that you struggle with getting clean is because you're addicted to you. And what you feel, what you think, what you want goes above everything around you and... So this addiction is an attempt to soothe your conviction about addiction. Mm. I know a lot of people don't like to hear that. But in reality, that's the bottom line of it. So I started out in AA back in 1988. September the 7th, 1988. I just celebrated 36 years. I say I celebrated. I didn't have a party. I just recognized and acknowledged uh, 36 years, clean, sober, uh, no substitute. I didn't go through a treatment program. I got into AA. Some people uh, say, a friend of mine uh, that has been addicted, he said, AA don't work. Uh, it's proven it don't work. Well, it didn't work for him. It worked for me. And uh, I had an old school sponsor in there that uh, he just cut to the chase. And he said, if you want to if you want to uh, keep drinking, go back out there and drink some more. You want to do drugs? Go do some more drugs. That's your choice. You can do that if you want to. But if you want to get sober, then you need to put the plug in the jug and keep coming back. Uh, now, I'm, and I'm going to tell you, every great once in a while, I go to a meeting still. 12-step uh, meetings now look nothing like, they sound nothing like they did 36 years ago. They're not even close. There's no comparison uh, to those the meetings now and what I sat in 36 years ago. Uh, what's the difference? Well, the main difference is... Uh, Back then, there were groups that were strong, 
and groups that were not. Matter of fact, they called them sick groups. And uh, my sponsor used to tell me, you go over there if you want to, but I wouldn't because those people are, they're wallowing in being sick. He said, if you want to get clear of your past, you need to work the steps. The steps for me led me into a relationship with God. Now, I will say this, that AA was not enough for me. The germ kernel of AA was. It was enough for me to step right out of the world and start getting a relationship with God. I gave my heart to Jesus and I started living uh, that life. And But there were things that I was hearing that was strongly diluting a relationship with God. Here's one of them. Once you're an alcoholic, you'll always be an alcoholic. Or once an addict, always an addict. Hey, if you want to remain an addict or an alcoholic, you go ahead. I'm not one. That's not who I am. I am the redeemed of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm not who I was. So there's a there's there has to be a strong stand right there. You've got to make up your mind. I, I was accused of practicing what they called black belt AA. That uh, I don't want to hear you whining. I'll let you talk all you want to. I sponsor very few people because I don't sponsor anybody right now. I'm totally involved in uh, ministry and I help people uh, break addictions but I don't sponsor anybody through the 12 step program because it's, it's kind of like, well, okay. When I started school, uh, they were just starting kindergarten. I guess I started in 1964, maybe <clears throat> they, kindergarten was just starting up. I started out in the first grade and I, and I always thought, why, why would you need to go to kindergarten? See, my mom taught me at home how to count to 100. I knew my ABCs, and I knew how to tell time when I started school. There was three things that they wanted you to know. Uh, and so uh, I had a stay-at-home mom. And so... It's kind of like, why would I need to start out in kindergarten if I can just go ahead and start the first grade and start learning how to write my ABCs and learning how to uh, do some simple things that's going to set me up for the future. I didn't need to know how to color. <laughs> I didn't need to know how to hang around other kids and stuff like that. And so why, why would, if we have the gospel, this gospel right here. If we have this, why would we want to start out in something that lets you have a God of your understanding? Now, it sounds like I'm speaking strongly against AA. Uh, I'm really not, uh, but I'm telling you this, it'll only take you so far. And there's going to come a point, you're going to have to get a rock solid relationship with the Lord. And why you did what you did doesn't matter. Uh, the Bible's clear about it that uh, we did that stuff because we had a sin nature. Because we uh, followed the flesh and not the spirit. So let me tell you my story about uh, just quickly. This is going to be a, a brief summary of it. I quit drinking September the 7th, 1988. I quit smoking pot. I uh, quit popping pain pills, doing all that stuff. And I was a train wreck. Uh, I wasn't dedicated to holding a job. I wasn't, uh, you know, I still like chasing those neon lights and uh, all that went with that. I like clubbing. Uh, I like getting high. And, uh, but my life had hit a, a spot where I knew this is it. I changed now or I decided to stay like I am and go off a cliff someplace. 
And uh, so I, I made the phone call. I got into AA. I didn't know anybody that was even trying to get their life straightened out. And I got, I got the meanest, orneriest guy in there to be my sponsor that had a walk with God to be my sponsor. He hated me so much that the first six months, he wouldn't even admit he was my sponsor. And he didn't like being my sponsor after that. And uh, so and his name was Clyde. Everybody needs a Clyde, I'm telling you. And he disliked me so much that he absolutely would tell me the truth. And it was like he enjoyed hurting my feelings. And so, but that's what I needed. I needed somebody to smack me right between the eyes with the truth and say, this is what it is. And so he continually, he stayed on me about working the steps. He fully expected me to go back out. He fully expected that. And he would tell me, you know, anytime that I pushed back a little bit about uh, about the um, uh, the steps, he'd say, don't worry about it. Don't work them. Go on back out there and get you some more. And I was like, no, no, I'm not leaving. He said, then work the steps. Shut up. <laughs> that's, I, that's the kind of sponsor I had to have. And with a lot of you that's going to see this, that's the kind of sponsor you need. And, uh, so I, from day one, relapse is not part of the program. That's, that's the direction a lot of people choose. Here's the thing that got me. They said, you know, they told me that I didn't have to drink anymore. didn't have to do drugs anymore and all that. But here's the part that got me is they said, Clyde said, you don't ever have to live like that again. Boom. I'm in. Sign me up. That's what I'm looking for right there. I don't want to live like that. I never liked the person I saw in the mirror. So from day one, from the time that I quit, no more drinking, no more drugs, period. September the 7th, 1988. Just crossed over 36 years. Uh, but here's one thing that I struggled more than anything with, smoking, quitting smoking. So I was running from a call to preach. I'd been running from it for 10 years. And uh, so now I'm a guy that I've quit I've quit uh, drinking, I've quit doing drugs, and I started going to AA all the time, and but I also started going to church because I knew I was called to preach. And the Lord had called me 10 years before that. And so, but I had a problem. I'm a preacher that smokes. I wasn't preaching yet. Get this, I wasn't preaching yet. I was trying to learn to preach. <clears throat> I was ministering to people. I was going and uh, talking to people at jails. I was talking to my friends about Jesus. So, but the problem was I'm now a preacher that smokes. So I thought, I've got to quit. i got to quit. And with me, I can't halfway do anything. I am, I'm either going to quit or I'm going to do it. So I quit cold turkey. 30 days, man, I was a basket case. I found a scripture in Proverbs 16 and 3. It says, commit thy works unto the Lord and he shall establish your thoughts. I knew that was significant. I didn't understand fully what that meant other than I've got to do my part and God will come in along behind me at some point and make up the difference. So I quit every day, every day, man. I had a full motion waterbed. You don't just get up out of those. Some of y'all remember those. You had to kind of roll out of it. And so I just roll out of it and roll right over on my knees and I'd pray before I even uh, got up to go to the restroom. I'd pray and, uh, start my day and all day long I was praying, Oh God, please don't let me smoke. Please don't let me smoke. Please don't let me smoke. I was a basket case. I was mean. I was agitated. I was, uh, aggravated. Uh, I just, I wasn't, I didn't like being around myself. <clears throat> I was doing some, uh, karate back then and taking karate classes. I doubled up on my karate classes and took a lot of my frustration out there and, 
day 30, I, and I didn't smoke, but I felt like I could smoke a cigarette 10 foot long in one drag. Uh, day 30, I rolled out of bed mad. I was mad. And I said, I'm done. This is it. No more. No more, no more. I'm done. And But before I got up, and I was saying, I'm smoking today, God. I was talking to God, mad at God. I was griping at God. I'm smoking today. I've done my part. I've uh, 30 days now, I've not smoked a cigarette, and I'm worse off now than I was when I started 30 days ago. But I said this right before I got up. I said, but God, I know you don't want me to smoke. And I don't want to smoke. But the only way I'm going to make it from here forward, you got to remove the desire, God. I need you to remove the desire. And I got up and I walked away mad. I was mad. I was mad at the world. I guess I was probably mad at God too. Because I read that scripture and I knew that he didn't have a way out of that. I was doing the work. Proverbs 16, 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord and he shall establish your thoughts. My thoughts still on a cigarette. God, I had that thought when I started into this. And I was mad at God. About 2... 2.30, 3 o'clock that day, I realized I hadn't craved a cigarette all day. It shocked me. I'm like, what? Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I have, I'm not consumed with the thought of smoking a cigarette. And I realized he established my thoughts. When I asked God to remove the desire, God did. He, and then I realized he had been doing all 30 days, all month, he had been doing exactly what I asked him to do. Oh, God, please don't let me smoke today. Please don't let me smoke today. Please don't let me smoke today. I made it 30 days praying that pitiful prayer. And I made it. I wasn't smoking. But when I asked God to remove the desire, he did. He did. The Bible says, fall on the rock and be broken, lest the rock fall on you and grind you to powder. Folks, I pray that you find something in this. I could talk about this all day. I'm going to make this video short, though. And I'm going to tell you, Proverbs 16 and 3, read it. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Put it in your car. Put it in your mind. Put it in your heart. Commit thy works unto the Lord and he shall establish your thoughts. You got to decide what do you want? And I promise you, God will help you get it. When I asked God to remove the desire, he removed the desire. And I have not smoked now since about six months into my five, six months, somewhere there into my recovery. Haven't drank from day one. Haven't smoked pot from day one. Haven't done any drugs from day one. September the 7th, 1988. But the cigarettes was a tough one. There's some of you out there that smoke. You're battling with it right now. You're a believer. You're doing what you can to live this life, but you can't kick it. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I ask you, to reach into these people's lives right now, God, and remove the desire. If they have a real made-up mind and they're willing to white-knuckle it for a little while, God, remove the desire for cigarettes, for sex, for pornography, for promiscuity, for alcohol, for drugs. Remove the desire from them, God and help them to walk up right before you. And we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love you, folks. I love you. Consider what I've said today. These are real words of life. Trust me, it works. I love you. And right here in East Texas, I'm still keeping the faith. God bless. Hey, guys, we appreciate you tuning into this video today. And man, I'm so thankful for all of our subscribers. If you want to partner with us and help support 
this ministry, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can do it through PayPal at stillkeepingthefaith1 at yahoo.com or you can go over to Cash App and do dollar sign SKTF1. And you know, guys, whether that's $1, $5, $100, whatever God lays on your heart, if it's a one-time offering or if you decide to partner with us on a monthly basis, we're grateful for you. And we thank you for listening in. And right here in East Texas, we're still keeping the faith.